predict my marathon time to the nearest second. So for example, 2.28.52. If you predict it to the nearest second, I will personally send you a So welcome back to the channel, episode eight of the Road to Valencia marathon training series made in collaboration with Sort Running and Coros. Um, I can't believe it's two weeks to go now until the Valencia Marathon. Um, a big thank you to everyone who sent good luck messages um, and supported the series so far. In today's episode, I'm going to do a bit more of a Q&A. So if you watched last week's episode, episode seven, I asked for people to drop their comments, uh, drop their questions in the comment section below of that video. I've put all those questions um, together today to answer those in a 26.2 um, questions. One question, the point two is for you at the end there, so make sure you stick around for the whole video. It's going to be a little bit more of like a podcast style, so feel free to grab a cup of tea. I have myself, um, and we'll rattle off some of these questions, but I expect it to be a little bit of a longer episode. But first, a little mention from our sponsors, um, Saw Running and Coros. Coros make the best running watch on the market, um, which I use at the moment, the Coros Pace 2. It's used by Elliot Kipchoge um, and some of the best runners around the world. It's super, super accurate, and it has some really detailed features, yet it is all put into a really simple watch that's easy to use. And if you want to check out a little bit more about the Coros Pace 2, I'll leave a link in the description below. And Saw Running have kindly sponsored this series as well. I've been using their gear throughout the whole of this training series. I'm currently wearing one of my favorite pieces, the Wooltech um, T from Saw, and I'm also going to be wearing their singlets to race in. This is my race singlet for race day. And let me quickly show you the marathon shorts. Very, very um, special shorts, these. Um, they can hold gels in the front there, as you can see. Um, easily two on the front, and you can get at least four in the back pockets. So yeah, a big thank you to the sponsors of this series for getting involved, for helping me out. Um, and supporting the channel with this training series. But anyway, let's jump into the questions. I've got them all written down here on my laptop, so I'm going to glance over here um, and start rattling some of them off. So question number one is, what are your thoughts on high altitude training camps? And have you got any plans to do one in the future? So with high altitude, there's no secret that elite athletes um, across the world go up to altitude to train, and then they come back down to sea level and race. Um, and the idea is to recruit more red blood cells um, and to basically improve your fitness at high altitude so that when you come down to, to a lower altitude at sea level, um, your body is, is much more adapted to sort of getting oxygen into the body and performing at your best. Um, altitude camps is definitely something that I want to do in the future. They are very expensive, um, but I've actually got a one altitude trip planned next year if it all goes ahead um i don't want to give too much away but i'm really really excited about that one and it will all be documented here on the channel um and just a little bit of a teaser it's not in europe so yeah altitude training i definitely want to give it a go at some point on to question number two how do you get accurate splits on the treadmill so if you follow me on strava all of my training throughout this series has been on that uh, platform you can go back and have a look at it um, and I've been doing quite a lot of treadmill running purely because of where I live. When it gets dark, um, I can't really run outside other than a two and a half kilometer loop around the block just because it's in the countryside. There's no street lights um, and I don't really like running with a head torch. Um, I fell over last year and, and bashed up my hip quite badly um, from falling on a tree root, even though I had a head torch on. So I try to avoid running outside. So I do a lot of running on the treadmill. Now, um, I've been getting really, really accurate splits on my treadmill, and literally every time I post a treadmill run on Strava, people have asked, um, how are you getting such accurate splits? So I'm glad you've asked this one and brought this up. And the secret is the Coros Pace 2 again. Um, it has an indoor run setting, which basically you can tell the watch that you're running on a treadmill, and then you also tell the watch how fast the treadmill's going. So for example, if I'm doing uh, an easy run, that's usually around eight miles per hour. I tell the watch that the treadmill is set to eight miles per hour, I press go, and it gives me accurate splits, tracks my heart rate, my cadence, stuff like that. So I still get all the usual data than I, that I would from a run, but it gives me super accurate splits. It's a lot more accurate than other, other watches that sort of 
have to sort of predict your the distance you've ran based on things like your cadence um, on the treadmill, and it's it's always pretty an inaccurate, and you get some really wild variations in splits. Um, so yeah, if you're looking at to, if you're somebody who does a lot of treadmill running, then you might want to have a look at the chorus pace too. Um, it's one of the main reasons I use that watch, just because that feature is so good and unrivaled by um, a lot of the other watch companies, as far as I know. Um, moving on to question number three. So what are your plans after the marathon? So yeah, this one's looking ahead already for me. Um, my plans, immediate plans after the marathon is to take a little bit of time off. Um, this year has been pretty full on for me. I ran my first marathon in March. Then I sort of train, kept training for a half marathon. Um, I ran my half marathon PB in Copenhagen maybe two or three months ago now. And then I've jumped straight into a big marathon training block again um, for Valencia in December. So the immediate plans will be to take some time off. It's December. It's festive season. Um, so, so, yeah, take some time off with the family. Uh, enjoy some some runs when I fancy going for a run, basically, rather than following a strict plan. I'll also have a lot of XC races, cross-country races, um, in the calendar still to tackle. Um, I've got some big ones in February and just some local sort of uh, league stuff up until then. Um, Boxing Day, there's a fun race that I'm looking forward to doing. Again, another cross country. It's the runners versus cyclists. Hope that's happening this year and I'll be giving that one a go. Um, so immediate plans after the marathon is to take a little bit of time off and then, yeah, be jumping into another marathon training block in the new year. So question number four is how do you approach nutrition during the taper? So I personally like to keep things pretty much the same um, throughout my, my training block. Um, maybe during the taper, I think a little bit more about cutting out some of the bad habits. I don't tend to drink any alcohol in the three weeks leading up to a marathon. And I try to cut bad snacking habits as much as possible. Um, in terms of taper week, I don't really change a lot. I don't necessarily do a huge amount of the carb loading. I think nowadays, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, but I feel with the advancement in, in fueling in gels, um, you don't need as much carbohydrate sort of stacked up before the race. You can sort of maintain your energy levels throughout the race with things like gels and these carbohydrate um, based water um, bottles that you can take along the way. So I don't necessarily change too much. I don't eat. I'm certainly not somebody who eats sort of like six bowls of pasta the night before um, a marathon. And yeah, I don't really change too much. So question number five is what's next if you hit 220? British elite question mark so yeah if I hit 220 which will be amazing that's the goal for uh, Valencia um, I understand this goal is is really really sort of difficult one I've set goals in the past that I know are achievable this one I don't um, have full confidence in I think it's just the marathon distance is such a scary distance you never know if you're going to be capable of running the pace that you you think you're going to be able to run for that distance until the day um, so if I hit 220, that'll be incredible. Um, in terms of becoming an elite for the marathon, um, I've actually always thought about doing London Marathon. Um, and recently I've sort of come up with a challenge for myself that I don't want to do London Marathon until I can enter in the elite category, which is to run 218. You have to be a 218 um, marathon runner to get into that elite category. Um, so I've set myself that as a little bit of a goal, which I know sounds crazy because that means I may never do the London Marathon unless I can get that elite um, time. But I think over the next three or four years, I'm really hopeful that, that that can come a bit more of a reality. You have to excuse me on this one. I've got a bit of a cold, as you can probably hear. Um, it probably wasn't the best time to sit down and do a sort of podcast style episode. But yeah, bear with me. Got a cup of tea. That should also help. Question number six is what sort of micro cycle do you follow? So I currently follow a seven day uh, training cycle. It's actually written behind me just there. Um, that's my training plan written by myself. I'm self coached um, and I typically do two sessions a week and a long run. Um, but during this training block, I change things a little bit. I usually do my sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I found that I wasn't recovering from my Tuesday session in time for that Thursday session. So I moved it to Friday. Um, so I do a session on Tuesday, session on Friday and a long run on Sunday at the moment. And that's my current cycle. But I may consider doing maybe a nine day micro, micro cycle during the next training block um, just to allow myself sort of two easy run days in between each session and long run. So ideally it would be session, two days easy, another session, two days easy, long run, two days easy, back to session, if you know what I mean. 
Um, so yeah, that's something I'm going to look into next time. It's the beauty of being self-coached. I can sort of um, experiment with things and, and see what works and what doesn't work for me. And that's something I noticed this training block is I just wasn't recovering enough in between sessions. So it's something I've changed. So question number seven is how do you maintain a fast pace for a long distance such as 21 kilometers and above? So I have improved my speed endurance over the last few years, mainly due to threshold work. Um, I've talked about this a lot on the channel, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but it basically means training at the sort of speed that you can maintain for an hour. And I do a lot of that style of training, probably around an hour, an hour and a half of threshold running a week um, in my weekly training. And that's just really improved my speed endurance. Other ways to improve your maintaining speed over the, the distance is to, to race more frequently, get used to dialing into race pace and, and knowing that you can maintain that. Long runs really help as well. Um, I would even consider doing long runs further than my race distance unless I'm running racing a marathon. So, for example, if I'm doing a half marathon, my biggest my long runs would go up to sort of 32 kilometers. And that just really helps build um, get your body basically used to running hard for that duration of time. Um, with these longer runs, I won't be running them at race pace, obviously, because I'm planning to run further than race pace. But you want to run a little bit less or in that zone. Zone two for me usually is where my long runs set. And yeah, that really helps improve my speed endurance. So question number eight is what are your predicted race times on the Chorus app? So let me have a little quick look. Um, according to my watch, my 5k time is 14.15, 10k is 29.45, half marathon 65.48 and my half marathon is 2 hours 23 minutes and 58 seconds. So the 5k, 10k and half marathon are a little bit out there. Um, maybe I'm a little bit fitter than I was when I ran my PBs, hopefully I'd like to think so. And yeah, the marathon says 2 hours 23, which is still a great time. I certainly would take that um, in Valencia. Um, but hopefully I can squeeze a little bit more out of that um, on the actual race day. So question number nine is in your peak volume of 180 kilometers, how does that translate to time and what does your easy to hard ratio look like? So I had a little look back on Strava um, and according to yeah my peak training weeks, they're around 13 hours of running with 30 minutes gym session. Um, in terms of the easy to, to hard split, it was 61% easy. Again, this is according to my watch, 61% easy, 26% um, medium and 13% hard. Um, and that's my weekly distribution for the last four weeks. So almost following that 80-20% rule, um, I seem to have been doing a little bit more in that medium category, which I believe is where the, the threshold training would sit, which would make sense. And maybe those longer marathon sessions aren't necessarily classed as all out hard training because I'm training within a sort of within my threshold. Um, so yeah, 61% easy makes up the majority of my training and then that medium to hard makes up the, the, 40, the other 40% basically. Question number 10 is how do you recover from a marathon? Now I've only ran one marathon so I can only talk from that experience. Um, I sort of got back running within within the week actually. It was fairly quick. Um, I think because I'm somebody who trains to, at quite a high mileage, um, I'm used to sort of I don't know, the, the 42 kilometers in distance itself isn't too far. Obviously, racing it is, is different. Um, but because I train to a high mileage, I think I, my body recovers quite quickly from the marathon distance, uh, maybe quicker than some. Um, I will say it took me around three or four weeks to fully recover and, and feel like I wanted to be able to do speed sessions again, um, ready to, to sort of race. I think I did some sort of track races and, and a whole and some more road races after the marathon. So yeah, it took me a good three or four weeks, I'd say to fully recover, but I would, I could run sort of within maybe three or four days of the marathon. I was, I was sore. I wasn't recovered. That's for sure. But I could get back on my feet and, and start running sort of an easy 5k within about three or four days. Um, but in terms of recovery, I would, say yeah listening to your body is key because everybody's different when it comes to to recovering from a marathon um and don't rush back into it um certainly don't uh do a race sort of within the next month or even two months of the marathon just let your body recover and yeah ease back into training when you feel is right question number 11 is what is your fueling plan for the race so my fueling plan is to carry morton gels along the way um, attached in these great marathon shorts from Saw. 
subtle plug there. These re really are great. You can carry about six or seven quite comfortably um, in the front and the back. Um, so yeah, I'll be using Morton as my my fuel. I've reached out to Morton, seeing if they want to work with me, but they ignore my emails every time. So I have to keep buying them. I've used them a lot during this training period as well. Um, something I didn't do uh, for my first marathon is is practice my fueling um, before the race. I just sort of thought oh, I'll be fine. Um, so my plan is to take a Morton gel every sort of six to eight kilometers, probably take around six or seven gels throughout the race. That's just uh, the number I know that I'm that I'm confident with. Um, I know my body can, my stomach can handle that. Um, and yeah, that should be enough for me. I'm quite a, a slim built guy, so I don't need as much fueling as, as some. Um, and yeah, that's just a, a number that I'm comfortable with. Maybe I ideally would like to have bottles on every single table, but until I get into that elite category, I can't have bottles on the table. So yeah, I'll have to be a little bit flexible as well. I know on the course they've got power aid this year. Um, so yeah, I'll be grabbing some Powerade along the way as well to replace some of the electrolytes um, that I'm losing along the way. Um, yeah, that's my fueling st strategy for race day. Basically just Morton gels. So question number 12 is, can you give me three examples of marathon sessions? Um, yes, I can. So I've got them written down here. I just quickly rattle them off. Um, one of my favorites has been a, uh, a 15 kilometer continuous um, marathon session. Um, so it's a 5k warm up, 15 kilometers at marathon pace, and then a 5k warm down. Um, and that just, yeah, it's been one of my go-to sessions during this bl block. I really like it. It feels like it's a, there's a good amount of volume there to practice running at race pace, but not too much to completely knacker you. Um, other good ones to try are four by 5k with a kilometer float, or another one is seven by three kilometers. Again, at marathon pace with a kilometer float in between, adding that kilometer float with marathon workouts is really good when you want to increase your mileage um, you basically get some free mileage in between each rep um, so there's a little bit of a tip there for you with marathon based sessions if you want to to beef them up a little bit then add one kilometer floats in there as well so question number 13 is what shoe will I be racing in for the marathon uh, now this has been a tough one for me I'm still not completely um, I still haven't completely made my mind up but I'm basically toying between the Alpha Fly One, which I wore for my first marathon, uh, for me that shoe just feels super, super efficient. And the Vaporfly Two, um, I wore the Vaporfly Two this year for my half marathon, which I ran sixty-seven minutes for. So I'm almost um, sort of uh, gravitating towards that shoe at the moment, just because I know I can run faster than than I need to. Um, through the halfway point in that shoe. I'd love to try something new, but I just haven't had enough time um, throughout this training block. I've been training with so many different shoes. I haven't been able to sort of um, lock down one as my ultimate favorite. Um, I definitely would feel comfortable racing in the Asics Metaspeed Sky Plus. Um, the Adios Pro 3, again, is has been excellent in this training block. Um, but I think I'm still going to be stuck with Nike. I think I know a bit boring. So question number 14 is when do you think is the right age for younger runners to start marathon training? Um, so that's a tough one, really. I can't really talk from experience because I didn't start my running uh, journey, if you like, until I was 21 um, when I was at university. And then I ran for about two or three years before I started to think about doing a marathon. So I think um if I had to put a number on it, I would wait until you're at least in your 20s. Um, when you're younger, you want to focus on the shorter races. That's when you've got the most speed in the legs. As you get older, um, typically you get less like fast twitch muscle fibers and more longer twitch, if that's the thing. Um, so I would I would say don't don't rush into the marathon. You need to train with really high volume for the marathon that if you're young, um, can cause some issues. Um, so I would say maybe, yeah, 20 to 25 is when you want to consider doing your first marathon. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, some people might say later. I think if you look at the best marathon runners in the world, they're in their late 30s. So yeah, there's no rush. Don't rush into to marathon training and racing until you feel you're ready. So question number 15 is how do you stop yourself getting bored with the amount of running you do? That's a good question. Um, I'd I'm not going to lie, I do find runs boring quite often. Um, I certainly don't enjoy every single run in, in my training week. Um, but some of the ways I make them a bit more interesting is by running with other people as much as I can. So I run with Chelmsford Athletics Club. I go down there twice a week. Um, even if I'm not doing the same session as some of the boys, it's nice just to socialize with them and know, knowing that they're 
getting their sessions done while I'm getting mine done. That can be really motivating. Um, I also like listening to podcasts when I run. Um, some of my favorites at the moment are Coffee Club, um, Inside Running, and For the Kudos, all running related podcasts. Um, yeah, a bit boring again. But they're some of the ones I listen to and yeah, music as well helps sometimes when I'm when I'm not feeling so motivated to help get out the door and put a good album. And an album that really, really helps me get going is um, by Foles. I think it's the it's the album with Mountain in, Mountain at My Gates, Mountain at My Gates in it. It's a really good album, gets me going. I put that on sometimes when I'm treadmill running and yeah, time flies. So yeah, that's some, t- that's some of the, the ways I deal with, with boredom whilst running super high mileage. So question number 16 is quite a specific one. Um, any tips for dealing with IT band pain from increased distance? So I am necessarily experienced IT band pain myself, touch wood. Um, but I would say that one of the exercises I do in the gym um, really helps with this. It's called kettlebell crossovers. I'll see if I can find a video of it. Um, basically, you stand on one leg and lower the kettlebell to one side. And it just helps stretch out the IT band, work on them stabilizing muscles and hopefully strengthen that area so that, yeah, you don't have any issues when you increase your mileage. So my advice to you would be to try and add that in to your strength and conditioning program and, uh, yeah, see if that helps. Question number 17 is, can you give me an explanation on hill sprints? So, yes, I can give you an explanation on hill sprints, but I'm going to be totally honest. I've completely neglected them for this training period. Um, I'm trying to think of an excuse. Valencia Marathon is typically very, very flat, so I don't think I need to be super good at running up hills. Um, but I have used hill training before in my in my training and it's very, very effective. It's almost like doing a strength workout in the gym and a session at once. So you get a good bang, good bang for your buck, um, if that's a saying, uh, from hill training. And from my experience, there's two ways in which you can do hill training. You can sort of do the continuous hills, which is um, a more Kenyan style. You might have heard it called Kenyan hills. Um, you basically run up the hill. At a pretty fast pace probably I don't know around 70% as fast as you can and then you float down so you also sort of go down the hill at a fairly steady effort as well so you sprint up the hill and then you steady down and that you can do that continuously for half an hour that's a really really good workout that I've done before and then you've got your more traditional hill sprints where you literally sprint as fast as you can to the top of the hill and then you walk down um, and use that as your recovery and then you do it again really sprint up the hill and that's really good for building explosive power so yeah, hill training is really good and something I should definitely look into. So question number 18 is what is your B goal for uh, Valencia? So my A goal is to run 220.59. Anything 220 is the goal, A goal. Uh, B goal, if I start to blow up and I see that time slip away, I'm going to stay motivated by my B goal, which is 225. Um, and the C goal is to PB. So to break 228, which is what I ran in my debut marathon back in March. So question number 19 is what is your favorite distance to race? That's a good question. Um, my favorite distance is probably the 10K, narrowly beating the half marathon. Um, I like the 10K because I feel like I can do it. Uh, I can race a 10K pretty much every other week if I wanted to. Um, and I love racing. So, um, yeah, I probably would pick the 10K. I'm, I'd pick 10K over the 5K just because I feel a little bit more competitive when it comes to the longer distance stuff. Um, there's a lot of guys who can beat me over 5k, but not, but not so many who can beat me over 10k. Um, so I'm a little bit more competitive over that distance. And at the moment that probably would be my favorite distance, but I absolutely have loved the marathon. Um, yeah, the sense of achievement that you get from crossing the line is like no other race. So yeah, at the moment I would say 10k, but I wouldn't be surprised in a few years if I said marathon. So question number 20 is what headphones do you use? So I currently use the Open Run headphones. These aren't the ones I'm wearing now. I'm using these just so I can hear the audio from this microphone. It's the first time using it, by the way. So apologies if it's a little bit hit and miss with this episode. Um, but yeah, I use the Open Run headphones. They're bone conducting headphones. I think I've got the box here. Let me just grab it quickly. Um, yeah, these are the headphones, Open Run Pro. Um, and they're really good for um, safety. Uh, where I live is, is country roads, so I like to be able to hear the traffic. Um, and they're bone conducting, so they sit on the outside of the ear and basically allow you to hear all the traffic. Um, and yeah, they're really good. I've not had any issues with them. Had them for about six months. Um, that's actually a pair for my sister's Christmas present. Um, and yeah, they last for about 10 hours. Um, and yeah, they're pretty good for for podcasts. Um, I will say if you, if you use them in the gym, um, because they're open ear, 
Um, you do hear all the gym noise as well, so they're not ideal for gym situations, um, especially if there's loud music or or treadmill noise, um, which is what I'm having to deal with most of the time. So I prefer in ear earphones for treadmill and gym stuff. But for when you're out there running on the roads, then yeah, the the Shocks Open Run Pro are the ones I use. Question twenty one is: Would you ever consider coaching? Um, so yeah, maybe in a few years down the line, I'll, I'll look at coaching. Um, but for now, um, my sort of time is, is going to be spent on my own training. Um, and I, yeah, if I'm totally honest, I don't think I have enough time to start coaching athletes. I also don't feel like I've got quite enough experience yet, um, or not enough experience at all, really. I've only ran one marathon and I started running, um, in 2020, 2019, sorry. So I've only been running for three and a half, coming up to four years now. Um, so I'd like to have a bit more experience under my belt um, of different training methods. Um, maybe I could start coaching a few athletes and see how it goes. Um, but that that won't be something I, I look into maybe for the next few years, if I'm totally honest. So question number 22 is, what do you really think of sore running? Now, I get these questions quite a lot in my DMs over on Instagram. What do you really think? Um, now, I have a rule sort of for myself and for my the content that I create is that I only support and promote uh, products that I genuinely use in my training um, and I'm a fan of. Uh, now I've been using sore running gear for the last sort of year and a half. Um, I was kindly sent some, um, so I've never actually brought anything from sore, which obviously is going to cloud my vision a little bit in terms of uh, reviewing the kit. But I try to be as open as honest as possible. It's definitely the highest quality training apparel that I've ever used. Um, nothing has come close um, in terms of, of the quality. Um, I understand the price point is extremely expensive um, in comparison, to say, if you walk into, uh, I don't know, Sports Direct and look at a running T-shirt, um, the price difference is going to be huge. But I do think the quality is, yeah, is warrant. Um, and if, you, if you're if you somebody who's picked up some sore running gear, I hope you've not been disappointed. Um, and you can also feel that difference in quality. Um, for example, the singlets are so so thin that when you're wearing them on race day you can hardly hardly feel it's there especially if you're racing in a hot climate um they're really good so yeah my honest opinion of saw is they have incredible running apparel um and it it warrants the high prices even though i've not had to pay them myself um and yeah saw running have kindly offered a, a discount code for the duration of this training block 15 percent off using bir15 and i'll leave a link down below um but yeah go check it out if if spending that sort of money on training apparel isn't for you you don't have to i'm not going to force you um but yeah i will say it's the best quality training apparel and racing apparel um in the running scene at the moment so question 23 is how have you been getting on with the Cordycep mushroom supplements? So for people that don't know, the Cordycep mushroom supplements are a product that I've been taking from Pure Sport for the last month and a half. Um, and these little mushroom uh, capsules can supposedly um, increase your body's ability to produce ATP, which is the way your body sort of carries energy around the body um, throughout exercise, cardiovascular exercise. So I've been taking them for the last month and a half. Um, and throughout this training block, I have been keeping track of my VO2 max and it started off at 68 and it is currently at 70. So it's gone up two across this period. Now, a lot of that comes down to my training, um, and the efforts I've been putting in through my sessions. Um, so I can't, I, I'm never going to be able to sort of quantifiably tell you whether the cordyceps have made a difference, but I will, what I will say is if they have made even the smallest um, one two percent increase in my overall fitness then I think they're worth it I've certainly not experienced any negative effects of taking them daily and I will continue to take them um, for that benefit um, over the next few months and yeah hopefully they're doing something but I don't think I'll ever be able to quantifiably tell you yes they have been improving my cardiovascular fitness um, but they're not an expensive supplement I think they're around 40 pounds for 60 capsules um, and they don't have any side effects that I've experienced. So I will continue to take those and give you my feedback if I notice any big, big differences. So we're nearly there. Thanks for bearing with me. Question number 24 is what would you have done differently in this training block compared to your Copenhagen marathon training block? Um, so this time round, I've increased my overall peak volume by 20 kilometers. So when I ran Copenhagen uh, marathon the peak mileage was 160 in this training block it's been 180 kilometers 
And overall, I would just say I've had a little bit more of a focus on marathon type sessions. So a lot of sort of almost slower sessions, but with greater volume, especially my Friday sessions, the sort of four by 5k stuff um, I didn't really do for Copenhagen, which I think is why I suffered a little bit towards the end. So I'm hoping that come Valencia, I'll be able to to maintain my target race pace for a lot longer than I did in Copenhagen. Question 25 is how important is strength work? So I think strength training for marathon runners is is really important. Um, you probably can get away with with not doing it whatsoever um, because marathon train marathon running is a little bit different to sort of um, sprinting where you're really reliant on on muscles to be really strong. Um, but I personally do a lot of well, I don't do a lot. I do 30 minutes of strength and conditioning work a week, and I think it really helps with injury prevention. I don't necessarily do it to to get stronger. I just do it mainly just to stay injury free and touch wood. It's been working. Um, so if you're somebody who doesn't do strength and conditioning, I certainly would um, consider incorporating it. Um, it doesn't have to be super super heavy and and super time consuming. Just a little bit and often a little bit and often really helps. Um, keep those injuries at bay. So question number 26 is, do you have any plans for your next marathon? So the short answer is, yes, I do. Um, I'm not going to tell you um, where it is yet, but again, I can reveal it's not in Europe and it's a very, very exciting opportunity that's coming in the first part of next year, um, which I'm really, really looking forward to, but I'm not going to say any more. There will be another marathon um, and it won't be in Europe. And finally, question number 26.2 is a question for you. Um, predict my marathon time to the nearest second. So for example, 2.28.52. If you predict it to the nearest second, I will personally send you a sore running singlet of your choice, of your size, obviously, and a Coros Pace 2 um, as a little bit of a giveaway to say thank you for all the support on this series. Um, if you get it spot on, that is. If not, I'll pick the person who gets closest. Um, so if you want to enter that competition, all you have to do is comment down below my the marathon time you think I'll run on Valencia. And yeah, basically uh, the day after Valencia, have a look at the comments and whoever gets closest, I will send you a singlet of your choice and a Coros Pace 2. Sound good? Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much for bearing with me on this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the more podcast style um, format. It gives you an opportunity to ask some of the questions um, that have been that you guys have been asking and I've not really had the time to get back to you. So I appreciate you for watching this video. If you're still here at the end, big, big shout out to you. Um, but until next time, aspire to run, run to inspire, and we'll see you again soon.